Hey folks, welcome back to Combo Class. I'm Dumotro, and look, I fixed my gun! Never mind. I was gonna say I fixed, never mind. In any case, I love sequences of numbers. When you see a sequence like this, you can try and guess what each term represents. Like this one is square numbers. The nth term is just n squared. This one might be a little harder to decode. It goes up and then down and up and down. But if you spent enough time analyzing this, you might realize this does describe something. The amount of factors of each number. One has one factor, two and three have two factors, four has three factors, and so on. But what about this sequence of numbers? A one, then an infinity, then a five, then a six, then an endless amount of threes. How weird, infinity is hanging out in here twice, like an infinite amount there, then an infinite amount of threes. But this sequence does describe something incredibly important. I call it the hyperdice sequence. But let me start from the beginning on our first term, which actually lines up with the first dimension and explain what's going on. In the first dimension where everything lives on a line, there's really only one type of enclosed shape we can make there, a line segment. And every line segment, regardless of its length, has very similar traits. They have two ends, which we can consider like their vertices in a way, and one enclosed length. And that's what this one represents. How many perfect polytopes, which we'll grow to see the definition of, can exist in the first dimension? And the answer is just one, a line segment. But what about the second dimension, where we get an infinity symbol? Now in the second dimension, if you used one-dimensional line segments to combine at corners and enclose an area for a shape, even if I made the restriction that any of these shapes had to be regular, meaning that all of their sides were equal to each other and all of their angles were equal to each other, I would still have an infinite amount of options. A three-sided triangle, four-sided square, five-sided pentagon, and more and more sides. Any amount of sides I could pick, approaching what looks like a circle, which is so round it's technically not a polygon like these. And to zoom outward, two-dimensional polygons are also 2D polytopes, a polytope being a more general term for an enclosed shape. Now, we should also note that with ones like the pentagon, I could have crossed it over like that in a star way instead. Technically, all of these corners would have the same angle as each other, but in a way that crosses over. So we're not just gonna be looking at regular polygons and polytopes. We're also gonna make the restriction that they are convex, meaning that all these angles go outward without needing to cross in that way. So we have an infinite amount of regular convex polygons, our 2D polytopes, but what about the third dimension? Why does it go down to five? Now the reason I call this the hyperdice sequence is most clear in the third dimensional example, because you're used to 3D dice. And I have a bunch of these. <laughs> but out of all the dice I have, in terms of shapes or how many sides they have, I think there's only six types. And five of those six are a lot more special than the annoying sixth one. Let me get one of each different type of dice I have. Here's one of each of the different types of dice I have, not in terms of color or number or anything, but in terms of shape. Now these five I really love, the ones with the amount of sides four, six, eight, 12, or 20. But the 10-sided one I'm not as fond of. If you look up close at it, each of the sides is a weird kite-like thing. And although it does roll fairly, its sides aren't 
regular polygons like all of these ones. Now, this isn't a fault of the dice manufacturer. It's actually impossible to make a 10-sided 3D shape where the sides are one of these regular polygons and they wrap around in a convex way, meaning not spiky like that, with the same number of one of them meeting at each corner. It's impossible to do for 10 sides. In fact, it's only possible to do for these five types. They're known as the platonic solid shapes and they're very important and cool. Now, why are these the only five ways of taking a 2D perfect shape and wrapping it around in this convex way to make something like dice? Well, let's go to a little arts and crafts corner and prove why these are the only five. Here in our mathematical art lesson, there are any number of regular polygons I could draw but which ones could tessellate a plane? Meaning take one of these shapes and tile it like a carpet with no gaps. Well, a full rotation's 360 degrees, or you could define it in radians or other ways, but this would all be the same. And that's a multiple of only some of these shapes' interior angles, only the triangle, square, and hexagon. So those are the only three regular polygons that can tessellate a plane without gaps, like this. On a hexagonal grid, we have three hexagons meeting at each corner, and three hexagons add up to the whole 360 degrees right there, making them add up to kind of a flat plane for three of them. Whereas if we wanted to use shapes as the faces of a 3D object, we need at least three faces meeting at each corner, and their angles have to add up to less than that 360 to have room to fold downward into this other dimension. So hexagons are too flat, kind of, to have three of them fold into being faces of a perfect die, and any regular polygon with more sides than six would be, definitely wouldn't work because it can't even tessellate the grid. Three of them take up too much room. So why don't we look at some pentagons? Now with regular pentagons, if I tried to fit three at a corner, there's a little gap in there, which is why they can't tessellate a grid like a carpet. But that gap might come in handy if I'm trying to fold these into the third dimension. So let's cut these out and see. If I use this extra room to fold these into the third dimension and tape these two sides together, I get the corner of a potential shape. And if I had kept doing that on all of these corners, it would meet on the other side perfectly to form a dodecahedron, the 12-sided perfect shape, and the perfect shape with the most amount of edges per face. We're gonna have to now look downward and sides to the good old square. Well, if we looked back at the square grid, we can see that four squares meet at each corner. So with four squares, it takes up all of the room of the plane with no extra room to fold like that. But what about if we had just three squares? Once again, I can fold these into the third dimension using that extra gap and then tape two of the sides together and I get the corner of a potential shape. Then in this case, if I continued the pattern from these corners all the way around, I get a good old cube. And once again, four of these take up all the space in the plane, so that's too many, and two of these obviously couldn't make a 3D shape, so the cube is the only perfect one that uses squares on its faces. So to look for more potential perfect shapes, we're gonna have to go down in amount of sides on our polygons to triangles, the only amount of sides left. And with triangles, 
we have six of them meeting at each corner. So we actually have a few options if we want to have just some sides meet at a corner and have some extra space to fold it around. Now we're going to need at least three to make it three dimensional, but we could take just these three triangles and try and fold them in all that empty space. Or I could take four that meet at a corner and have a little less empty space. Or I could even take five that meet at a corner with just a little empty space. Now let's see what happens when we cut each of these three out. This boat looking three triangle one, when I fold it around, if I continued on the other side, would make a tetrahedron, which has three triangles meeting at each corner. And this kind of Pac-Man looking four triangle one folds around to make part of an octahedron, which has four triangles meeting at each corner. And the five triangle one folds around to make part of the 20 sided icosahedron, which has five triangles meeting at each corner. And more triangles would just give me a flat plane and less triangles than three obviously can't be three dimensional. So these are the three perfect shapes that use triangles for faces. Now, since we can't go higher than hexagons, and hexagons themselves just tiled a plane with no more room, and we only had one that used dodecahedrons and one that used squares, well, these are the only five perfect shapes. In terms of being a 3D shape, where your faces are regular polygons and you have the same amount of them meeting at the same angle at each corner. All right, now that we've learned why these can be the only five perfect 3D shapes, let's head back to our combo classroom to learn some more stuff. Well, now these five shapes were investigated by the old philosopher Plato, who actually believed that they were related to elements. And apart from the dodecahedron, which he more briefly described as something that maybe the gods used in the creation of our heavens or universe, these other four, he believed, were what made up the classic four elements. These spiky little tetrahedrons were believed to be associated with the element fire, and uh, these rolly 20 sided ones were associated with water. And cubes were believed to represent Earth. And eight-sided octahedrons represented air. <laughs> Now we know that elements aren't exactly made of those shapes, but they are very important shapes. If we look at a chart of some important aspects of these five shapes, like how many faces they have, how many vertices, also known as corners, and how many edges, there's so many cool patterns going on in here. One of which is that for any of these shapes, if we add up the number of faces and number of vertices and subtract the number of edges, we get something interesting. Well, here, four plus four minus six is two. Here, six plus eight minus 12 is two. Eight plus six minus 12, two. 12 plus 20 minus 32. And it will always be two for any 3D polyhedra shape of that sort. And even in some other circumstances, like if I draw what's known as a planar graph, where I take a bunch of random dots, put wherever I want, and I connect them with line segments, however I want. I don't have to connect all of them if I don't want. Well, then if I add up the number of vertices, in this case, six, and the number of faces, including the outside region as one face, in this case four, that adds to 10, and subtract the number of edges, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, I get two. This magical formula is sometimes known as Euler's formula, but the great mathematician Euler invented so many formulas that on the Wikipedia page for things named after Euler, one of the first sentences says how 
he invented so many things that often they name his discoveries after the second person who found them just to make the name more convenient so everything isn't named after Euler. <laughs> now, this one, to be more clear, some people call Euler's characteristic. With this chart, you may have also noticed that some of these shapes seem to have each other's numbers but flipped. Like the cube's amount of faces are the octahedron's amount of vertices, and the cube's amount of vertices are the octahedron's amount of faces. And there's a similar flip between the dodecahedron and icosahedron. This is because the cube and octahedron are each other's dual shape. And an awesome way to imagine their relationship is that if you took a cube and you made a dot at the center of each of its faces and used those as vertices for a new shape inside the cube where you connected the vertices to each other, you would get an octahedron. And same with the other way around. If you made a vertice at the center of each of these faces and connected them on the inside, you'd get a cube. <laughs> same with the dodecahedron and icosahedron, which are each other's dual shape. <laughs> so awesome. Now with the tetrahedron, we notice it's not paired up with anyone else. It's kind of paired up with itself. And that's because the classic tetrahedron, an underrated shape because the cube steals so much of the credit for 3D shapes. The tetrahedron is its own dual shape, where if you played that game and made a vertice on the center of each of these and connected it on the inside, you would get another tetrahedron. Now to flash back to where we're at in our sequence to look at the whole context of things. We saw that if we're looking for perfect shapes, considering perfect to mean a convex polytope where at any corner the same amount of things meet and those things are the perfect shapes from one dimension before, well, in the first dimension we just had one perfect shape, a line segment, and in the second dimension we had an infinite amount of regular polygons to make, and in the third dimension we had these five. Well, in the fourth dimension, you may notice a six. And that's because in the fourth dimension, where it's very hard to visualize shapes because our brain's not really built to understand 4D. And in a later episode, I will try and describe the shadows and cross sections of these shapes, but we can't fully visualize a 4D shape. Although I like to try and imagine them by imagining 3D shapes as the faces of something with some four dimensional volume. Well, here on the list, we got a six because not only do these five have similar versions to them in the fourth dimension, but there's another, the hyperdiamond or the 24 cell, a mysterious shape that manages to show up in the fourth dimension, but there's no version of it in the third. But beyond the fourth dimension, if we look at what convex polytopes that are regular in this way exist in the fifth, sixth, seventh, or any dimension higher than fourth, there are only three possible ones. Higher dimensional versions of the tetrahedron, the cube, and the octahedron. No longer do versions of dodecahedrons or icosahedrons get to exist, or the 24 cell. It's like with not enough dimensions, you don't have enough room for enough options, but with too many dimensions, you hit some strange restriction as well. Now, I nickname this the hyper dice sequence because it's how many dice-like shapes you can have in each dimension. And by dice-like, I mean not only are they these regular polytopes, but they're also convex, not spiky like that one. And convex, if we want to be technical, are the shapes where if we connect any vertice to another vertice with a line segment, that line segment would lie in their interior, not anywhere outside them. 
And we can see by this spiky one who lives in the second dimension that there are two dimensional spiky ones, which actually are technically regular perfect polytopes. They're not convex like that, but each of their five real vertices out there has the same angle coming out of it. Now, when we count how many of those live in different dimensions, we don't have any in the first dimension because there was just a line segment. We have an infinite amount in the second dimension, and then we have exactly four in the third dimension that are regular polytopes, but not convex. And in the fourth dimension, we get 10. And then after that, all the future dimensions, for some reason, don't allow perfect spiky ones. Once again, in this strange middle point, you get an infinity and some normal natural numbers. And before that, it's like the dimensions didn't have enough room to grow. And after that, it's like they had too many restrictions of some sort to grow. Now down here, I've added up all of the regular polytopes that can exist per dimension, convex or not. And we have 1, infinity, 9, 16. And I find it pretty interesting and weird that these look like the square numbers. 1 squared, 3 squared, 4 squared, except with 2 squared replaced with an infinity, and then with endless 3s afterward. So pretty weird. So overall, I like to think of these as hypershape sequences. And you can even make other ones for stranger types of polyhedra, like ones known as skew polyhedra, which don't follow normal Euclidean rules of space. So I didn't include them in this video. This is for shapes that follow the regular geometry you're used to. Now with these hypershape sequences, there's so much mystery and coolness. And sometime before long, I will take you into the fourth dice mention and onward. Because although we can't visualize these shapes fully, we can try and visualize them in ways by either doing math about them to prove traits, or even by trying to make pictures or images or videos of shadows or cross sections of them. Well, now we know that the five platonic solid shapes don't actually live inside the elements earth, air, fire, or water. But they are magnificent shapes, and there are glimpses into this strange full sequence, which will which we'll see more about later as we enter the fourth dice mention. Until then, have a safe day. Thank you for coming to Combo Class, and I'll see you next time.